in the UK, uh, just to put in context, UK population now about 64 million, uh, around about a quarter of a million people a year start something social. Now for many people that will be purely voluntary, but for 100,000 a year it becomes something that takes on a legal identity. 100,000 people every year. That's, that's the sort of population that we're looking at as social entrepreneurs. The legalities are different in each country and, and the practicalities of using them are different too, but conventionally you'd see a spectrum from uh, n pure non-profit charities, as we'd say in the UK, through social enterprise, trading, but majority of profits reinvested for social purpose, what we call profit with purpose business, and if you're interested in that, that's the, the new model that we developed last year with the G8, uh, where you're committed to social benefit, but profit distributing. You've got ethical companies, and you've got the dark side, the unethical companies. So you would see that as a, as a spectrum. We don't see it as a spectrum. We see it as two independent axes. How committed are you to social impact, and how much profit do you distribute? It is perfectly possible to commit long-term for social impact whilst being fully profit distributing. And if you think that's not the case, Tata Industries, one of the largest companies in the world, now 85% owned by a foundation. The profits, 85%, go to do social good. You can have massive companies. Mondragon in Spain, another, another very big example. Social entrepreneurship is now a, a global movement. It's becoming a part of popular culture. Uh, in the UK, we've got half the universities in the country now providing social entrepreneur support. Schools, colleges, local authorities, companies, all sorts of, of folk. Um, it is clearly becoming a major part of the future. 23 out of every 100 new companies formed in the UK last year were social mission. Now, I think the UK is ahead of the curve, but we see the curve everywhere we look across the world. Uh, it's clearly the new way to make the world better. It's very much the new business. And it's also, interestingly, become, and this is a bit dangerous, the new call. To me, social enterprise is a legal construct, but social entrepreneurship is a movement of people. So if we take our social enterprise legal construct, is the community interest company, and there are about 12,000 of those. But as I mentioned, there are 100,000 people every year who say we're starting a business and it will be social. And the great majority of them are using a company form because mm. they can just get on and do it. If they're restricted to special forms, investors aren't comfortable and mm. buy it, what is this? And, you know, and, and there's rules and you've got to do it this way and you've got to do it that way. And people just, I just want to do good. I just want to do good, just let me do good. So I'll just take a normal company form. The, the idea that you chuck in everything that you think is good into one model, you sort of almost disable it because there are too many rules, there are too many expectations. You spend all your time ticking these boxes instead of getting on developing the enterprise. But however you look at it, it isn't marginal. You know, in the UK, it's 23% of all new companies are social. This is big, big deal. Now, they're not, they're not adopting social legal forms, but they are committing themselves to social value. I tried to make a little mapping to just show in a few slides how I try to create some structure in whole de all the, the whole debate on um, social business and their legal structures. So of course if you start from a big mapping of organizations and their motives, on your left hand side you have the pure non-profits, the non-profit organizations, the foundations who are fully subsidized, who are not on an economic market, who are not competing with regular for-profit businesses. Um, for example, hospitals, education, uh, all sorts of welfare activities, which are in fact subsidized by our state. That's very social, but it's not social business. Um, then you have certain of those nonprofits who have additional economic activity, a limited economic activity, such as a cultural uh, organization who has ballet and other. Uh, performances which are subsidized by our state, but they also have a restaurant and a bar at which they serve drinks and food after the different uh, cultural performances. So that would be a first type of economic activity, but it's still developed by a non-profit organization. And then you have the social enterprise, which 
has a specific legal form, which I will show on the next slide, who has an economic activity, but who has engaged into a legal form prohibiting them or limiting the distribution of profit. So we'll show you on the next slide. It's a company with social purpose, which in itself is created to allow business, how do you put it here, profit with purpose or business with a social purpose, but in a company form, which usually the company form would be purely for profit, would be created by shareholders who expect a return, who would maximize dividends, would be at the, end, at the other end of the spectrum, but here in the middle of social enterprise, who does not have any or only a limited financial return on its investment. And so all these on the left side of the line are mainly motivated by their social profit, the social impact that they want to create. We call those the social entrepreneurs, the, the true social entrepreneurs. But as you said before, Cliff, the, in my mind, also on the right hand side, the regular capital company with a CSR project, apart from its own activities, is also very social as well as the socially responsible company aiming for social output with its own activities, such as, for example, a cooperative company which was created to produce green energy. They sell it, it's an economic activity, but they create true social impact because they create green energy and it's linked to its legal setting. While for the capital company, a big pharma company with a CSR project in Africa for people with neurological disabilities is also a social project. But of course, the profit-making motive and the financial return still is very important and comes first. This does not mean that they are not involved in social initiatives, but nevertheless, it is a scheme which I try to use to set out the different legal forms. The company with social pur purpose is also rather unknown and a bit treated like the stepchild uh, by uh, a stepfather or stepmother when we think of the, the traditional corporate lawyers. They're not familiar with social business. I don't think we are as far yet as uh, the UK. If I hear your numbers, they're very, they're huge on, on social enterprises. Um, and I also know that some of my corporate law friends, true corporate law friends, always wonder what you do in your practice. Is there, I mean, do you know how to spend your day? So they find it's, they, they still, they're not very familiar or not familiar enough yet with social business, so not familiar enough with the company with social purpose. We have today 750 companies with social purpose and it's still perceived as soft business. That's a challenge. I mean, we need to get rid of the idea that it's still some sort of charity or philanthropy or CSR. So I think that's a, a, another challenge. Personally, I think the ideal world would be that we don't need new business models for <coughs> social entrepreneurship. But like uh, Cliff said, by creating them, you also create leverage on the regular business models, and, and that's how things evolve. That's how we saw different movements in our history and different movements in society. So it's kind of pioneering. It's the pioneers who use the new business models to then influence and try to make a difference in the regular business world. But ideally, we should try to make regular businesses socially responsible or at least uh, social entrepreneurial. What they use are five conditions for social enterprise, which is the organization must engage in economic activity, so not social welfare, but economic activity, must, be, must pursue an explicit and primary social aim so having it written down in your statutes or in your articles of association as the primary goal is important. It must have a limit on the distribution of profits and or assets which are created by the business. It must be independent from states, okay, so not the NGO which is fully subsidized. And finally, it must, be inclusive, it must have an inclusive governance. So allow every potential uh, stakeholder to have a vote or a say in the business. So that's the definition they use, but they also say that in all the countries that they have um, looked into, there's different accents and it's just a question of accepting that this would be the five criteria of social business, but maybe after doing a, 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 a round table with a lot of people involved, you would come up with something different. But at some point, if you want to compare the different countries, that's why they use this 
as the five criteria for social business and then went into looking do we have a legal form in our countries, mm -hmm. in our member states, which meets these five criteria. Mm -hmm. And then the company with social purpose comes close. So I think the legal form will not, at the end of the day, determine whether you're ethically and truly a social business. I think it comes down, and I think that's the, the common factor in many of the questions that you ask or the comments that you make, is it comes down to basic ethics, to ethical conduct. And you could yeah. have a... Uh, and the, there, the bottom line is you cannot oblige people to have a certain ethical code. You can try to have a common sense that a minimum ethical standard is important to level up in the world, but if you look at the news every night, you know that we have a lot of work to do, not, not necessarily in Europe, or not as much in Europe, but in many parts of the world. Um, so the legal form, I wouldn't say that it's a guarantee on truly social output. But if it is used by the right people, and if it is um, used in a way that you have accommodating measures, so for example, accountability on what did you do with the year, on the, on the potential transactions which could create abuses, mm -hmm. like you do in the US, they have certain transactions which are forbidden or which need to be listed every year, big foundations to do that, big charity 501c3s need to do that. Um, the accountability and transparency standards do level up and make sure that people are aware that there is a certain ethical standard to respect.